We will be starting in just a few minutes. Again, thank you for joining us. We just want to give people time to uh, join us before we officially start at 11 a.m., but really appreciate you making the time to be with us this morning. Um, and while we're waiting over the next five minutes before we start at 11, feel free to let us know where you're joining from um, in terms of your organization that you're representing. And also since, um, you know, I think it's a pretty emotional, somewhat overwhelming time. So feel free to put any words of support you want to share with your, your fellow um, colleagues that are on the ground, really working hard to support our community during this incredibly challenging time. So again, as people are joining, I see people coming up on the participant list. We're going to get started right at 11, but wanted to go live so that we could give people a chance to um, join us while we before we start promptly at 11. And again, feel free to put in the chat any where you're joining from or um, any words of support you want to share with your colleagues. And then we'll get started right at 11. So just a couple more minutes for people to join. People are feeling shy and not wanting to share where the, or you can just share what organization you are from um, or the organization you're representing would be great. I think I can see that in the chat. And it's not just that uh, people are not um, responding quite yet, but feel free again to, yay, Jennifer, <laughs> thank you from UIKai. Thanks for joining us. Um, feel free again, everyone to let us know your name and organization that you're representing um, while we wait for people to get a chance to join us. And then we will start right at 11. I see, okay, I can see the attendees so I can call you guys out. I see George Chan is with us, several of our affiliate nonprofits, which is great to see. Welcome, George and Sylvia. Thanks so much for joining us. Oh, and Sharon from Korematsu Institute. Thanks for being with us. Again, feel free while we're just waiting to get started at 11, feel free to let us know um, your name and which organization you're representing in the chat. And then we'll get started um, in just a couple minutes. I want to be respectful of everyone's time and start promptly at 11. So I see, oh, oh there you go. They, yeah, people are using the chat. Hi, George. I know you kind of had to <laughs> respond since I called you out. And Terry from OACC, Oakland Asian Cultural Center. Thanks for joining us. Again, feel free to let us know where you're joining from in the chat and we'll get started in just one minute. Um, Oh, yay, and we have Carrie from Asian Pacific Community Fund, our uh, partner, almost like sister organization down in LA. Great to have you with us, Carrie. They are um, one of the lead partners for us with this campaign. So thank you to Asian Pacific Community Fund for all your support as one of our key partners in pulling off our Given May campaign. And we'll just wait one more minute. Anyone else feel free to let us know where you're joining from in the chat. And then we will get started right at 11. Just a couple more minutes. Let's see Terry. Oh, Kari also from Chinatown YMCA. Welcome. Oh, great. Also, Alele from Asian Law Alliance, as well as Sylvia from Friends of Children with Special Needs. Thank you all for joining us. All right, it's 11 o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started. Um, many thanks again for being here. And um, we're going to kick it off just by giving you some given me basics. Um, but first, I wanted to just for those who don't know who I am, I'm Audrey Yamamoto, Executive Director and President of the Asian Pacific Fund. Um, and we are one of the proud hosts of the Given May campaign. Last year was our inaugural year. We co-hosted it with API Data. Um, and then had several strategic partners that helped with the outreach. Um, one, of the, one of the main ones being Asian Pacific Community Fund down in LA. 
Um, and essentially for those who maybe didn't participate last year, it's a national movement in philanthropy that's modeled after Giving Tuesday that happens over the month of May. Um, and last year was a phenomenal year. You know, the fact we pulled it off during the pandemic, but also shattered our expectations. You know, we thought maybe we'd get 50 nonprofits participating and raise 50K, but we actually had 92 nonprofits from across the US participate um, and raised $270,000 for those nonprofits, 2,600 donors from across the US. So um, it was really an inspiring moment for us. And we look forward to building on that momentum going into this year. So with that, I will um, turn it over to my colleague who some of you have received, many of you have received emails from, Pei An Yi, who will share a little bit more about the basics um, before we dive into the content for today. Hi everyone, can anyone, can everyone see? Oh, you can see me. Hi everyone, I'm Payan, as Audrey said, and I'm the face to the emails that you've been receiving. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I'm gonna cover some of the details about this year's campaign. Um, as Audrey said, it'll happen during May, which is also Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. The campaign will kick off at 12 midnight Pacific time on May 1st and end at 11.59 PM Pacific on May 31st. Everything you need to know about that campaign can be found at givenmay.org. We also updated our toolkit and have new resources, so please check that out. That's also where you'll be able to register to be a participant for this year's campaign. If you're a returning organization, you will still need to register, so please make sure to do that. If you're a new organization who's interested in joining, we actually changed our criteria this year. So you will need to be an IRS registered 501c3 or fiscally sponsored by one. 51% of your population served must be Asian American and or Pacific Islander, and you'll need to be at least two years in operation. Um, for this year, the other thing we're asking for is a main point of contact. This should be the person who will be the administrator for your Mighty Cause webpage, and they will also be the person who will receive all the updates and announcement emails. Um, and a piece of good news and maybe an incentive for all of you to join this campaign is that the Wallace H. Coulter Foundation will be sponsoring our Given May Awards this year at $100,000, which means all the award amounts are increasing. And in addition to that, we're adding an additional tier of how we're dividing all the participants. So now it'll be between small, medium, and large organizations broken up through your operating budget and you will be competing for the most dollars raised and the most unique donors. Um, before we move to the presentation, a little housekeeping, we will be dedicating some time for Q&A, but please feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you see your question already there, you can upvote it. I believe it's the thumbs up sign, and then I'll move the question up and we'll try to answer those first. And we're also recording this webinar, so we will share the link to that along with this PowerPoint presentation for everyone who is on this webinar, but we'll also upload it onto the website in case you missed the email. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to Linda Gerhardt, who is our Senior Community Engagement Manager at an amazing partner at Mighty Cause, who will be sharing more details about fundraising and how to make the most of your campaign. Linda? Hi, thank you. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background as to who I am, why I'm here, and why you'll be listening to me speak. Uh, my name is Linda Gerhardt, and I'm the Senior Community Engagement Manager for Mighty Cause. Um, and Mighty Cause is the technology partner for Give in May. Um, so part of my role is helping uh, both the nonprofits that are participating and the whole event as, as itself get set up for the big event. Um, so that's why you'll be listening to me speak. And before um, we get into the nitty gritty of using the platform, I really wanted to give some uh, fundraising strategy tips because that's really what uh, Given May is all about is fundraising and talking to your community and your base of donors. Um, so we'll go ahead and start there. And even though we are talking about Given May, these are applicable to any fundraising campaign you would want run throughout the year. Next slide. 
So I wanted to start off with email strategy because especially in this day and age, your email list is really your secret weapon when it comes to fundraising. Um, and the reason for that is that you have a direct line to every single person on that list. You don't have to worry about an algorithm or whether or not they'll see it, it'll appear in their inbox. So it's really a great way to quickly get a message out to your base of supporters. Um, so I wanted to share some best practices about email marketing um, at Mighty Cause part of what I do is our email marketing. So I'm happy to share um, some best practices so that you can get ready for this year's Give in May campaign. Um, really a best practice um, and an overarching rule is you want to keep it short, sweet, and simple. Um, unfortunately, most of us don't read our emails word for word. We skim. Um, so you want to make sure that a person who's opening your email and skimming it can get the idea from your headers, your use of images, and that you have a strong call to action that they can respond to, which we'll get to in just a moment. Um, Something that's extremely important when it comes to email marketing, especially if you have a larger list, is segmentation. And when I talk about email segmentation, what that is, is taking your whole email list, everybody that's on your supporter list, and then breaking those into smaller groups based on an affinity or something about them that's alike. So for instance, your recurring donors, people who give to your organization on a monthly basis, they would be one segment. Um, if you have uh, donors over $100, that might be another segment. Um, and an important segment, especially if this is your second year with Give in May, would be your Give in May donors from 2020. Um, so that's just an idea of how you can segment and get a little bit more specific when you email your list of supporters, um, because people are much more likely to pay attention to and read carefully emails that speak specifically to who they are and the relationship they have with your nonprofit. Um, schedule and timing is also important for Given May. It's a month long event. So you need to sustain momentum for a full 31 days. Um, so you want to think about what is an appropriate cadence for your nonprofit. Are there some segments of donors that you want to talk to more often and some you want to scale back a little bit with? Um, where do you want to spend most of your time? And take a look at what you're doing now and see what feels natural to your nonprofit's communication style and your overall strategy. Um, obviously, if you go from sending no emails to sending them 20 a week, that might turn people off. So just ramp it up slightly and think about the scheduling. I would recommend for given May at least talking to them once a week and possibly even setting some mini fundraising goals from week to week. So think about your timing and how often you want to talk to your, your whole donor base and if there are any segments that might need a little bit of extra attention with your emails. Um, these two go together, uh, make it mobile friendly and test your emails. Um, so most people are checking their inboxes from an app these days. They're not often going on to their desktop computer and opening an email. Um, so when you're going through your email marketing software and you're putting together your emails, just make sure you choose an, a mobile friendly template and then test it. And when I say that, I mean, don't look at it on your, uh, your screen as a preview for a mobile device. Actually look at it on your phone um, because different apps behave differently. So sometimes something that looks great in mobile view on your browser when you're working on it um, looks a little funny when it's actually in an app on a smartphone. So make sure that you're actually pulling out your phone and testing. Um, and then also just test for copy editing and make sure that your links work. Um, there's really no worse feeling on this earth than sending an email out to hundreds or thousands of people and it having a broken link. Um, so that's why you want to have people check your emails. Um, the best practice here is two sets of eyes other than yourself. Um, so if you have our small organization, you can also loop volunteers into that. A lot of um, organizations have uh, volunteers who are happy to help you copy edit and click on links just to make sure that they're okay. Um, and finally, we talked about this at the beginning of the slide, um, but make sure that your uh, call to action is very clear and has a donate link. Um, typically, you'll see this as a button with a hyperlink um, for given May participants. That will be a link to the page you're sending your donors to on the Give in May site to make a donation. And just make sure that it's clear. Um, sometimes nonprofits can sort of default to softer language, um, like please give. Um, you really wanna have a strong CTA, like donate now, give today, to really inspire them to action and also capture the attention of people who are skimming their emails. 
Next slide. Social media is also going to be extremely important. I mean, it's much more important in our lives in 2020 and 2021 than really it's ever been. So this is a great place to reach your supporter base um, where they are, because most likely they are on their phone scrolling through social media. Um, and my biggest piece of advice here for Give in May and for any campaign is to sort of stay where your audience is. Um, obviously, that doesn't mean don't post anywhere but one platform, but take a look at where you have the most followers and the most engagement on a regular basis. So for instance, if you have, uh, you know, 50 followers on Twitter, but your Facebook has 20,000 followers, you'll want to show a little bit more love to your Facebook audience and post there a bit more frequently. Um, so just dedicate the most time and effort to where you feel your, your audience is paying the most attention and where you can reach the most people. Um, Something I also recommend is scheduling everything you can ahead of time, especially with a month long event like Give in May, you want to make sure that you are consistently reaching out to your audience with social media and saving any live posts for things like celebrating milestones, like raising your first $1,000 or hitting a goal or a little mini goal. Um, but schedule what you can just to promote your campaign as you're getting your campaign together so that you have those tent poles in place and you know that you're talking to your audience and that will make the whole month much smoother for you, whether you're using um, some of the tools that are built in through these platforms like TweetDeck um, and, or you're using a program like Hootsuite or Buffer, um, it is helpful to take the time to schedule as many posts as you can just so that you really just have to fill in the blanks and live post anything that is especially timely. Um, something that uh, all of us have sort of gotten used to lately is considering a live stream, um, definitely with the month of May to fill time and keep people engaged. Um, people are looking for things like live streams and that can give your uh, social media audience, it can get them engaged, make give the sense of community and camaraderie Lottery. Um, so definitely plan on at least one or two live streams during the month of May if you're participating in Give in May. And if you're not and you're just planning a regular campaign, it's definitely an extremely useful tool right now um, because we can't gather in large groups. So a lot of our spring events are just going to have to go virtual and live streaming is a way to still engage your audience and be present without actually having to physically be present when it's not safe to do so. Um, you want to stick to content that is known to be uh, well suited to social media, like photos, videos, and stories. Um, things like photos and videos are especially helpful when we talk about social media algorithms. They tend to get more engagement. Um, text posts are fine. Link posts are fine. And definitely include a link. But things like photos and videos that catch people's attention when they're scrolling social media on their phone are more likely to uh, get attention and get more donations. Um, and then always include a call to action with a link. So um, sometimes you have a really great story or a really great video and you get so wrapped up in telling the story or writing accompanying text that you forget to attach a link. Um, so just make sure that you always remember that link. It's really basic, but it's also very easy to forget. So I just wanted to remind everybody on social media, always make sure you have a link. And on places like Instagram where you may not have the ability to provide a direct link, um, make sure that there's one um, accessible through your bio, like through a link tree, um, or you can even just place it directly in your bio. Next slide. Um, so donor retention is going to be really important for organizations that participated in Give in May last year, especially. Um, and we do have some tools that you can use to identify who those donors are that need to be retained, which we're going to talk about a little bit later on in the webinar. Um, but obviously, it's easy to retain a donor who's already bought into your organization. They've already shown that they have a propensity to, to support you. They've uh, shown that they are willing to give and they've participated in either Give in May or a past campaign. Um, so it's really important to target those donors and make them a key part of your fundraising strategy. Um, we do have a report. Again, we're going to go into the nitty gritty of how to get that report a little bit later on. Um, but you want to make sure when you're putting your communication strategy together, donor retention is a big part of it. Um, across the board in the nonprofit sector, um, donor retention is pretty low. Um, and you want to make sure that you're doing all you can to engage those donors uh, because it's easier and cheaper to 
retain an existing donor than it is to acquire a new donor. So sometimes we get lost um, in donor acquisition and trying to get new people on board, but donor retention is really the low hanging fruit um, and it's much more time effective and cost effective. And an easy way to boost your fundraising amount is to work with these past donors to get them to increase their gift size. So that will help you boost you the amount you raise overall. So for instance, if you have a list of people who gave under $30, you could send them a targeted email asking them, to give 35 or $40 and just bump that amount up a little bit. Those $5, $10, they do add up and they will increase your total overall. And so that's a really great way to talk to these donors specifically and also boost your fundraising. Um, and then also one new thing you can do, we're going to talk a little bit more about how you can do this on the Mighty Cause platform, but track your donor retention. There are some tools where we can, uh, you can just plug in your donor retention dates and you can track, you know, who you've retained from last May to this May, and you can see the percentage very easily on Mighty Cause. So you can also set that as a goal to bump that up a few percent percentage points, um, just to make sure that you're staying on top of donor retention. Uh, next slide. So this is a really great fundraising strategy. Um, the first year of a giving event like Give in May, it's really about getting acclimated, but securing a matching grant is a way to boost your fundraising in your second year. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about what a matching grant is. And essentially it's a large donation from a donor or a grantor um, that you leverage to bring in new donors by offering to match their donation. So you're basically offering them a BOGO deal. So you donate $50, we actually get $100 as the nonprofit. And that's your marketing hook. And that's very appealing to donors. Um, so how do you get a matching grant? Where do you start? Um, it's very similar to uh, major gift prospecting and cultivation. Um, so the first place you start is figuring out who would give me a matching grant. That's called prospecting. Um, and you want to look first at your inner circle, the people who are already in your nonprofit's inner circle, people who are tried and true supporters of your cause. Um, so we're talking about board members, major gift donors, corporate sponsors, um, people who've already bought into your cause, they're sold. You don't have to do any legwork to convince them that you are a worthy cause. Um, so that's really where you wanna start. Um, what you can do is make a list of all of your, uh, your matching grant prospects and write out their contact information and how you've contacted, contacted them. It can be as simple as a spreadsheet um, and that gives you something to work from so that you can work on securing a matching grant. And so once you have a list of prospects, um, the next stage is cultivation. So that would just be sending the first email, breaking the ice, saying, hey, how are you, and talking to them. And the purpose here is really to get a sense of whether or not they are likely to give. Um, you can talk to them about, you know, how things are going. You may find out that somebody is really not in a position to give a large donation, and that way you can cross them off your list, and that way you don't have to ask them for anything. Um, you can just have the conversation and engage them, but leave them off your, your list of prospects to ask. Um, and you may find out that somebody's very warm to giving you a, uh, a donation, especially now. There may be people who are looking for a reason to give to a nonprofit like yours. So, you know, just start the conversation, break the ice, make the phone call, um, set up a Zoom, set up a, an in-person meeting if that's safe for you to do, um, and then just start that conversation. And the final step is to ask, uh, just to ask them for your matching, for a matching grant. Um, hopefully during the cultivation process, you've talked to them about Give in May or your other campaign and they know what you're doing. And so you've laid the groundwork and you can ask them for a matching grant. Um, my suggestion is to leave this pretty open and sort of let your donor dictate how much and uh, you know those sorts of details. So we do have a lot of flexible matching grant options through the Mighty Cause platform. Um, so one thing that I would recommend, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about the, the actual tool, but take a look at the different kinds of matches that you can do through Mighty Cause. Uh, there's actually quite a few. So you can do a traditional one-to-one -one match so that when you give 25, your grantor gives 50. Um, but you can also do things like a threshold match where the match doesn't kick in 
until you've raised X amount of dollars, like $1,000. Um, so there's a lot of creative things you can do. And so you can present these to your donor and just let them choose. And that will, uh, and that's a great way to, to engage them in the process. Um, and then something else you can consider, especially if you're smaller or maybe don't have um, many you know, major gift donors to tap or many sponsors to tap is uh, to think about cons combining smaller matches or smaller donations into one large matching grant. So for instance, you may have um, volunteers who are willing to give, but they're not able to give on a, a great scale. So they can pull together their money. And if everybody chips in 25 bucks, you've got yourself a nice pool of matching grant funds that you can say was provided by your volunteers. So that's just an example of how you can be creative and, um, you know, get get a matching grant together from a lot of different sources. Um, and one thing I did want to mention is that you should ask your board first. Um, they're often very, very warm to giving a matching grant. And as part of their responsibility to your organization, your financial health is part of that and helping you fundraise is part of that. So this is a great way for them to get involved. Um, and also if your board pays any dues, this is a great opportunity um, to maybe use their dues for a different purpose that will help you bring donors through the door. Next slide. So once you've got the matching grant, um, you need to promote it. Um, that's obviously an important part of it. If nobody has, nobody knows that you have a matching grant, then it's not going to be effective in its purpose. Um, so on Mighty Cause, you have a tool that you can use. Um, we, you just enter in the information and we basically do the rest for you. You tell us how much the grant is for, and you tell us the title that the, the grantor or the grantors would like to be referred to as, and what type of match it is, and we'll sort of plug it in on your given May site. So you can see on the slide, uh, the donate button has a little sticker on it. So anytime somebody goes to donate to your organization, they'll be able to see that a matching grant is available. Um, and one thing that's cool that I wanted to mention is that you, there is a, 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 we have a search page on the Given May site um, where you can um, actually search for organizations that have uh, active matching grants. And sometimes donors will do that because they want to make their donation dollars go a little bit further. So those are some places that are really built in. Um, but uh, I do want to, you know, you have to do some, some legwork to uh, promote it to your donors. So sending out an email, posting on social media, um, and, you know, anything you can do to generate excitement, because this is a really great deal for your donors. So share your progress on social media uh, and promote the match in your email campaigns. Um, so if you have multiple matches, you can even provide a schedule in your emails. There's a lot you can do to promote them. And the main idea of a matching grant is not the actual funding itself, but the marketing hook that you have. So take full advantage of it. And on all of your channels, make sure that everybody knows you have a matching grant, when it kicks in, and how much it's for so that they are prepared to donate. Next slide. So another great technique um, that is more sophisticated than you know just the first year where you're getting your feet on the ground and you're getting your feet under you or however you want to phrase it um, is peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. So that's kind of a step up. And peer-to-peer uh, -peer fundraising is a technique where you basically um, allow people to fundraise on your behalf and you recruit them to do that. Um, so you ask your supporters, your tried and true supporters to start a fundraiser and ask their social network to make a donation. Um, and the real beauty of that is that it opens the door to all kinds of new donors coming to your nonprofit for the very first time to make a donation. Uh, next slide. So as I mentioned, donor acquisition is really the magical part of peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. Um, a lot of nonprofits really struggle with the question of how to move beyond their existing donor base because you can send email after email, but that won't necessarily help your list and your supporter base grow. But that's what peer-to-peer -peer is designed to help you do. Um, and basically, you can't you can't solicit my Aunt Kathy because you have no relationship with her. You're not able to solicit her. However, I can start a nonprofit, uh, start an, a fundraiser for your nonprofit and ask my Aunt Kathy to donate and get her to make her first donation and tell her about all the great work you do. So that's really um, the 
the, the way that donors are brought in through peer-to-peer -peer fundraising and how it helps you expand your list of supporters. Um, and it also helps just, you know, generate some fun and excitement, some donor engagement um, for people who've been supporters of your nonprofit for a really long time. Um, this is a new fun way for them to get involved and feel like they're part of your work and part of your mission. Um, so it's also great for the people who start the fundraisers. It's fun for them and, uh, you know, it helps engage them in a new way. Um, and one thing that uh, we're always looking for at nonprofits is testimonials, people to talk about how great your work is. Um, and a peer to peer fundraiser is perfect for that because you're going to have people talking about what your work means to them right on their fundraiser and telling their family and friends and colleagues about it. So it's really fantastic for generating testimonials. Um, and again, it just helps generate buzz on social media. They're posting on Instagram, Facebook, they're out there. You basically have a little army of supporters who are there to support you and raise awareness of what you're doing for your campaign and entice people to donate to your cause. Next. Um, so peer-to-peer -peer is really what Mighty Cause was designed to do back in 2006 when our platform was uh, first launched. Um, so it, it's very easy on Mighty Cause. Your role is to basically just ask your, your supporters to donate. It's really as simple as that, or supporters to start a fundraiser. Um, you can ask them on social media. You can ask them in an email or both, um, but just send them to your Mighty Cause profile, um, and that's where they can start a fundraiser. So right next to your donate button, there is another button to the right of it that says fundraise. And so they just hit that button and that'll automatically connect their fundraiser to your organization. And we have a fundraiser wizard that kind of walks them through the whole process of setting up the fundraiser. And we also have a fundraiser template that's available. So for instance, if you're trying to get your busy board members involved, um, that's a really great olive branch to them to say that I've pre-filled some of the parts of your page. So just use our template for given May. And your, most of the important parts of your page will be already filled out. They aren't locked into it. If they want to customize it, they certainly can. Um, but that's a really great way to get more people in the door because you're making it as easy as possible. So everybody should have access to one fundraiser template on Mighty Cause. Um, and then they just need to set a goal and start asking for donations. It's really that simple. Um, so it's a very simple thing that is very powerful for your nonprofit. Uh, next, please. So just some quick facts about peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. Um, so all of the administrators for your nonprofit on Mighty Cause will get a notification email um, every time a new peer-to-peer -peer page is created for your nonprofit. So you will be notified and that is your opportunity to reach out to them if you want to share some talking points with them or help them out or just say, hey, thank you. Um, you will have an opportunity and you'll get a no notification letting them know that they just published a page for you. Um, Peer-to-peer -peer pages can be tracked in your campaign screen. Um, we're going to talk about that a little bit more in the technical section of the webinar. Um, but you can you can see all of the peer-to-peer -peer campaigns that have been created. You can also see whether or not they've published, how much they've raised, if they've ended, and you'll have some control about whether or not you want to hide old ones. Um, so you do have you know full visibility of everybody that's creating fundraisers for you, and you can see what they do and how they're doing. And if you have a lot of people doing peer-to-peer -peer for you, that's also really helpful because if somebody needs a little bit of extra help getting over the finish line, if they created a fundraiser and haven't published it yet, or if it hasn't raised any money, you can always reach out to them and say, hey, we'd love to help you. We want your fundraiser to be successful and see what kind of help they need if there's some sort of barrier in their way from getting published or getting their first donation. Um, and as a bit of housekeeping, uh, this is always a question with peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, I just uh, want to make sure that everybody knows that peer-to-peer -peer pages, they're all in counted in your grand total for your given May campaign. So they will automatically appear on your, your, your main profile on Mighty Cause, and they'll also appear on the leaderboard. So that doesn't apply to offline donations, but for any online donations that are made to a peer-to-peer -peer page, they will be included in your total. So you don't have to do anything to activate that. Um, that also applies to teams and events, um, which are sort of the next step up from uh, just a peer-to-peer -peer page where you're organizing that with a central page for all of your fundraisers, um, but they're all automatically counted in and they are eligible for prizes and they help make you eligible for prizes that are based on amount raised. Um, 
And peer-to-peer -peer donations, we just bundle them into your regular disbursement. So there's never any mini middleman. They go, the donations go straight to you um, and they're just included with the money that you get with all of the funds that you've raised on Mighty Cause for given May. So sometimes there's a worry about, are they gonna have the money? No, your, your nonprofit gets the money. Nobody ever has their hands on the money, but Mighty Cause, and then we send it to you. Um, so no worries about that. It's just included in your regular disbursement. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, one thing that we tend to forget about in the excitement of a campaign, but is really important, is follow-up. That's actually an important part of the campaign planning process is following up. Um, so you wanna make sure that you're including that when you're planning your campaign. Um, so when the campaign is over and you've raised the money after May 31st, um, update your, uh, you know, your your page to thank everybody for participating. And you do actually have some tools that you can use to thank your supporters after they make their donation that we'll talk with and talk about in just a minute. Those would be your thank you page and your um, custom message on the receipt. Um, it is very important that donors received a prompt and personal thank you. Um, one of the uh, top reasons why donors don't return to make a donation to a nonprofit to make a second donation is because they weren't thanked they didn't feel acknowledged. Um, so it is really important that you send that quickly. I think 48 hours is the space in which you tend to have um, to thank them, to make sure that they feel acknowledged. Um, and you also wanna pay special attention to your first time donors. Um, every new donor is an opportunity to steward your donors, get them down the donor pipeline and deepen their involvement in your nonprofit. Um, so make sure that you have a plan to follow up with your first time donors, whether that's a welcome series of emails or sending them a welcome packet in the mail, just make sure that you have something planned for them so that when somebody comes in and makes a donation for the first time, you don't lose them. You're actually starting to nurture them the minute they finish their first donation. Um, and definitely share your final results on social media in email. Um, when we drop the ball on this, when we don't wrap it up, people can feel very unsatisfied when they've donated to a, a fundraising campaign and they don't get the satisfaction of seeing how much you've raised and everything you're going to do with it. Um, and then also just include them in your year round stewardship and communications. Um, I think this is especially important for a campaign like Give in May, where you may be using different platforms and they only utilize Mighty Cause for Give in May. Um, make sure that those donors don't get siloed on Mighty Cause. Make sure that you include them in all of your communications year round. Next slide. And that's it. So we're going to move on to the questions. Yeah, I don't think we had anyone enter questions into the Q&A box. Does anyone have any questions? Linda maybe is just so thorough that all the questions are answered. But um, now is your time. I feel like the real value of being part of this webinar is getting to ask for support and, and get an answer in a really quick, efficient way um rather than having to look through slides or the recording later so definitely again you can click on that q a box if you have a question and you can just type it in there um any questions about the fundraising piece are welcomed and then um just so you all know this the remaining part after we get through the q a i'll give some people time to enter any questions they have but um, once we get through the q a that's focused on the fundraising aspect um, Linda will be spending the remaining time, the remaining time focused on kind of the detailed ins and outs of how to administer your page and access reports. Um, so the second part of this conversation is or this webinar is really focused more towards those of you who are definitely participating in the campaign and then also that are maybe more on the administrative side versus the fundraising side. I know for some organizations that's the same person, but if you're only on the fundraising side, you can feel free to drop off. Um, but let's get to the questions first. Um, let's see. There's one question that popped up. Oh, okay, great. We have a few questions, which I think you can also see, Linda. Um, oh, social media toolkits to promote our campaigns. We do have social media toolkits, and uh, Payan can give you the link to that. That will be available for you to use with messaging that's helping you to help you launch the campaign. And then we'll also be updating it during the campaign since you wanna keep the messaging going throughout the month of May. Um, how do you determine the size of the organization, small, medium, and large? Oh, great question. Um, 
because yeah, especially since I don't know for those of you who came in a little a little late, you probably didn't hear the announcement that we are last year we had 20k and given me awards for most donations, um, like most dollars raised and most unique donors, like those two competitions. Um, this year we're going to have a hundred thousand dollars in awards. So like we are really upping the ante in terms of like what you could win for second, third place. So the small, medium, and large organizations will be determined by us looking at everyone who registers. Um, and we want to divide those segments up, not necessarily in completely equal groups, but we kind of want to take a look at, because we know for smaller and medium organizations, this type of fundraising is probably that much harder. So there's a chance like those two segments might be a bit smaller than say the, the number of nonprofits in the large segment, but it will be based on looking at um, the whole, uh, looking at the total number of nonprofits you register and making sure that it's kind of fairly divided. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, and the question, are there requirements on agencies in terms of the percentage of clients who are API in order to participate? Yes, 51% is the requirement since this is really geared towards nonprofits who are serving the API community. Um, I'm happy to take the next one since they okay, perfect. addressed it to me. Um, it's, uh, it says, Linda, you mentioned that donations would be directly dispersed to nonprofits. When that happens, is there a platform fee that is taken out of that? Um, so one thing I did want to call attention to is that Asian Pacific Fund and the ho given May has been generous and they're covering platform fees for uh, your event. So there is a small fee that's taken out and that's to cover a uh, transaction that's not imposed by us that is imposed by credit card providers um, or PayPal if you use PayPal and that is 2.9% plus 30 cents per transaction. So it is proportional. It'll be a little bit higher for high donations and a little bit lower for small donations. Um, but yeah, there is that percentage taken out and that is the case with all platforms online. Um, and, you know, but Given May has really done a fantastic job to make sure that you are getting as much money as you possibly can. So we're not taking an additional platform fee from your um, from your donations and you will be able to see the breakdown on the disbursement report, which we're gonna talk about in the next second uh, part of the webinar. So you'll be able to see it, it's fully transparent, but um, you can also check the FAQ on the Given May site if you need to see that broken down for you. And I just wanted to add to that as well as that, um, that 3.5% platform fee something that you know we paid last year we actually have a generous sponsor who's paying for it this year um, but we do know that for um, sort of the best practice for all of these giving campaigns that mighty cause runs which is probably hundreds of them i imagine linda That's a lot <laughs> um, the best practice is actually that the um the transaction fee as well as a platform fee is something that the donors typically pay for you know they have a little checkbox would you like to cover processing fees most donors pay for it so um that's just something down the line if we ever had if we didn't have a sponsor that might be the case and it's good to know that donors have become accustomed to that um but for this year for sure we're covering the those platform fees so that um you're getting as much money as possible and then and your donors asked, do have the uh, sorry your donors do actually have the option to cover the transaction fees as well so they can click that box and they can cover the credit card fees so that 2.9 percent plus 30 cents um they'll be able to see the amount that is uh, would be charged to them if they chose to cover it, and they can cover that. And we find overwhelmingly that donors are more than happy to cover that for you. And that full amount is actually tax deductible as a donation, so they will be receipted for that. And then um, someone asked about, uh, do you recommend having a theme to our campaign? I mean, I can kind of speak a little bit to the overall messaging, Linda, and then you might have some more specific suggestions. Um, you know, last year, the overall messaging in terms of the, for the campaign was really about being um, responsive to the needs created by the pandemic. Um, this year, I think, be, you know, it's clearly still top of mind for people. Um, so I think we will be using language. It's probably a little bit more geared towards, you know, now more than ever, our community needs your support, especially in light of the surge in anti-Asian racism. And because of the enduring impact of the pandemic, like, that's kind of the messaging that we'll be putting front and center, but that doesn't mean that you have as, as an organization like on your page that you'll be um, designing and that you'll be kind of in control of in terms of the messaging directly to your donors. You could tie into that, you know, in terms of what you're working on in response to COVID or in response to the surge in the anti-Asian racism, or it could be 
something else that you are trying to raise money for as an organization that's um, a priority for you right now. So it really depends upon how much you want to customize it given your needs. But I don't know, Linda, if you had anything to add. Yeah, I think that just about covers it. It kind of depends on what you want to do as an organization and what you have going on. If there's like a fund that you want to draw attention to or a particular initiative, um, people do like to donate to things that are specific. Um, so somebody is much more likely to donate to help you to get a new roof than they are just to make a general fund donation. Um, so if you do have a, an opportunity to use that kind of messaging, it is helpful because donors really do respond to it. Um, but it's not required. You can always just send people to your give, give in May profile and they can make a general donation and that is also effective. So it really comes down to how ambitious you're feeling and what your needs are. And then uh, I think we have time for a couple more questions related to the P2P campaigns, Linda. One is about how to um, set it up and another one is how frequently to do them. Sure, so I'll answer the first one, which is what are some best practices to ask and support our network to engage in peer-to-peer -peer and to set up a fundraiser on Mighty Cause? Um, so first of all, I did wanna mention that Mighty Cause's support is available to your fundraisers. So our support team is available to any peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers. So if they have a technical question or they need a little bit of handholding to set up the fundraiser, you can always send them to Mighty Cause Support um, and we're happy to assist them. Um, the best practice is for asking them is just to do it. Ask if anybody's interested. Um, you can also target some people specifically if you feel like they're pretty likely to be interested in becoming a peer-to-peer -peer fundraiser. Um, and really just be available to them. Um, sometimes it's really helpful to provide them with talking points um, just be, so they can run a campaign well and talk well about your organization, um, you know, especially if you're running a particular campaign. Um, so just stay in touch with them. Definitely it's, an, it's a stewarding opportunity. These are highly engaged people in your cause. Um, so treat them as very engaged donors and supporters of your nonprofit and uh, be available to them and just support them along the way. Um, some nonprofit Profits will even send them regular emails if they have multiples uh, just to encourage them and to you know, say congratulations, way to go when they hit a fundraising milestone. Um, but yeah, as long as you're available and supportive of them, um, you know, I, th I think that's really all you need to worry about. If you wanted, if you have the time and the energy putting together a little toolkit for them um, with where they talk about where you can you know, give them some ideas for what they can do um, or have some talking points is, is really sort of up here in terms of <laughs> engagement, um, but just be available and stay in touch with them. And um, that's that's really, I think about it um, in terms of- Yeah, practices. one thing I was just gonna add to that too, in terms of, um, we haven't done it ourselves at the fund, but um, last year, I know at least one or two of the organizations that actually ended up raising the most money did it because they set up a peer-to-peer -peer campaign and it was through their board. So they sort of had like a competition friendly competition amongst their board members and encourage their board members to each do the peer to peer fundraising. So, you know, if it's not your board, I don't know if you have a, a advisory group or a group of volunteers, but it's kind of, I think it helps when there is a group that maybe has some kind of connection to each other and that you can, it's like, they're all in it together. Like that they're, there's a group of them that are each trying to raise funds. Um, kind of like, as if you're all like running a race and raising funds for you running that race. It's like, there's that sense of community that um, I think helps motivate people as well. Yeah, absolutely. And you could even, I've seen things like creating uh, private Facebook groups for peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers if you have enough of them where they can ask questions and share ideas. Um, and obviously the team's product is available to you if you wanted to do something more organized and actually sort of be a structured peer-to-peer -peer event. So that's something to consider if you think you'll have a whole group of people that, you know, would be motivated by some friendly competition. Board members usually are, especially if you have lawyers. Um, <laughs> lawyers raise so much money because they're so competitive. <laughs> um, and then the frequency, someone just did one in December, so they're not sure if doing it again in May. I mean, I feel like it's almost halfway through the year and a lot of people do fundraisers <laughs> twice a year, but 
Yeah, I mean, I would say if you were if you did one in spring and you were considering one again in summer, that might be a little too soon. But we're in a new year and season uh, fundraising is seasonal. So um, end of year and winter fundraising and spring fundraising are really two different uh, types of fundraising. So I think it's totally fine to ask them. The worst that can happen is that you maybe only get one or two fundraisers. Um, but the best thing that can happen is that you get a lot of people who are interested and start raising money for your nonprofit. So it's always worth 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 an ask. Yeah, and and I do think like even just from December till now, like the amount of media attention that the Asian Pacific Islander community has been getting in terms of our needs, given the surge and the anti-Asian racism, it has a dramatic effect on people's mindsets. Like I think people are looking for ways to help. Um, you know, just in the since Tuesday evening, we've received over 500 gifts, small gifts from like across the nation, across the world. Like it just it's been like an overwhelming outpouring of support that helps give me hope. Um, but I think that shows that like people are looking to give. So I, I actually, particularly in this moment, wouldn't hesitate to consider doing another one in May. Um, I think that's all of our open questions. I did just want to remind people that in the chat, um, Payen has been putting in different links to the toolkits um, in response to some of the questions that have been, ha have been, have been asked. So you can feel free to take a look at that. Um, a lot of it will also be available on the givenmay.org website once things launch so that you can have access to those um, as you need them once the campaign gets going. Um, but I think that wraps up the question, the Q&A for the fundraising section. For those of you who are only doing, oh wait, one more just came in. If donors donate offline, are you able to track it on your online platform? Oh, that's a good yes. question. Uh, yeah, definitely. We're able, you're able to enter it as an offline donation um, so that it's tracked in your total on your page and reflects your full fundraising efforts for the Given May event or your campaign if you're not participating in Given May. The only caveat to that is that on the Given May site, uh, prizes are linked to online donations only. So if, if possible, you want to drive people to donate through um, the platform uh, just so that you can become eligible for prizes and it's reflected on leaderboard. Um, but you can certainly just track it so that we get a full picture of what of the fundraising you're doing. Some people who want to write checks are going to write checks and you can just log them as offline donations. Okay, great. Thank you, Linda. Um, so I think that wraps up the Q&A. We'll move on now to the um, rest of the content that will be focused more on how to the ins and outs of administering your page and accessing reports. Um, so if you're only wearing the fundraising hat for your organization, you can like feel free to drop off. Um, for those of you that are also responsible for administering your page, you can stay on. And we may run a little bit over depending on how much um, Q&A we have, but we will try to keep it within the next 15 or 20 minutes or so. so yes, I'll talk fast. Um, <laughs> turn it back over to Linda. Oh, I, I can answer. We can answer this question through the chat that just came in. So okay. I'll turn it back over to Linda to dive back into the next set of content. Thanks. All right. Okay, so um, as Audrey mentioned, this is really about the technical in, in, ins and outs of preparing for your given May campaign. So it is a little bit technical and dry, um, but it is important. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody was prepared and has all of the tools and knowledge that they need to uh, utilize the Mighty Cost platform for given May. Uh, next slide. Um, so we talked about this a little bit in the beginning. Um, what does your nonprofit need to do to participate in Given May? Um, and obviously the first thing is to register. Um, as they mentioned earlier in the platform, Audrey and Payton both mentioned it. Um, you need to, there are some new requirements this year. And we also just need to affirm that you are participating this year. It doesn't automatically carry over from year to year. So if you have not already done so, feel free to go to givenmay.org and click the big red registration button and just fill out that form. Um, and as part of that process, you'll either um, be creating your profile on Mighty Cause or uh, just choosing it if you are already an administrator and you have your nonprofit page set up. You'll just be able to select it as the options there as long as you're logged in to your account. But if you're new to Given May and you're new to Mighty Cause, um, then you will need to go through the process of creating your page. So if you are in the IRS database, which is you should be if you are two years old, um, you uh, just 
can enter your EIN or you can search by name to find your nonprofit in our database. If you're fiscally sponsored or you don't find your organization listed in our database when you're trying to register, you will need to go through an extra step of creating your nonprofit page, which basically means click on a link that says create org um, and then just fill out a short form and our support team will work with you to make sure that you have a page set up for given May. Um, so once you're registered and your registration has been submitted and approved, you need to plan a fundraising campaign, which is what we were talking about in the first part of the presentation, um, and then promote that campaign through social media, email, um, digital events, or in-person events. I don't recommend those at that at this point, um, but depending on where you are, maybe you wanna have a small event, not gonna say anything, but um, yeah, just promote your campaign. Get out and talk to your people about Give in May and what you're doing and raise money. Um, so that is part of the uh, you know important agreement that you make with Given May is that you're going to participate and you're going to fundraise. Um, and then as we just talked about, invite peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers to participate. Um, you don't need to do that. It's not a requirement, but we definitely recommend it, um, especially if you are in your second year and then you just need to raise money. So um, those are really all the things that you need to do to participate in Given May. Next slide. So um, one thing that you'll wanna get very familiar with because you're gonna be spending a lot of time there is your dashboard. So this is sort of the hub um, of your nonprofit profile and all your nonprofit's presence on Mighty Cause and in Given May. Um, so I was referencing, referencing this screen earlier um, the overview screen is at the top of your dashboard and it's very important. Um, basically what it does is it gives you an overview of your fundraising efforts since you last logged in. And there's actually some really cool things that you can now do with your overview screen. Um, so you can add some metrics that you want to track. So for instance, if you want to track donor retention because you participated in Given May last year, you can set those dates and you can track your donor retention and see if that rate goes up as you, um, as you complete your campaign. Um, and you can do a lot of great things like looking at your year over year fundraising. So there's a neat chart you can adjust to, uh, you know, whatever dates you want. So take a look at your overview screen. There's some really cool stuff there. It's also where you can find out basic things like has your registration been approved. Um, it will tell you if your registration is pending or approved. So if you're not sure, just go ahead and check your overview screen. Um, and that's also where you'll find your to do list for the event. Um, Fundraising is the on your menu as basically everywhere you're going to find the tools that you'll use to run a campaign and manage a campaign. Um, so if you want to access your organization profile and edit it and cust customize it, you can do that um, on your on the fundraising sub menu. Um, you can check customize your checkout flow, which we're going to talk about more in a minute. Um, and you can see your campaigns. There's uh, basically if it's a fundraising tool you're looking for, you're going to find it under the fundraising sub menu. Um, and reports is pretty self-explanatory. We have a variety of report, reports available to you and any reporting that you're looking for is going to be under reports. Um, and settings is basically, um, all of the stuff that doesn't fit into any of the other categories, um, like adding and removing administrators. Um, now is a really great time to do some spring cleaning. So if there are people who are no longer with your nonprofit and don't need access, it's a great time to remove them. And if there's somebody new that you would like to add and give access to, you can do that through your settings. Um, if any legal information has changed, if your address has changed, um, you can update that information there. And then you can set up EFT through your um, disbursement settings if you have already, if you have not already set that up, um, up, that's our direct deposit option and that will make sure that you get your funds quicker and more frequently throughout the Give and May campaign. Next slide. Um, so the first thing that you'll want to do to get ready for Given May is customize your profile. Um, this is basically the face of your nonprofit during the Given May campaign. Um, so there's a couple of key things that you'll want to do. Um, uploading your logo is pretty much the first thing you want to do. Um, you may want to refresh it if um, you have a, a seasonal logo that you'd like to use, um, but that logo is going to represent you on the leaderboards. It's going to represent you 
on the given May site in the search, and it's going to be the face of your organization throughout the site. Um, so it's really important to upload a logo, and if you, you know, have a logo that is for the given May campaign specifically, you can refresh that to give it a new look, um, but that's a really key part of your profile on Mighty Cause. Um, number two is adding a banner image. So um, that is the image that sits right behind your logo, your nonprofit's logo. Um, and it really just helps, uh, you know, pull your page together. It makes it more personalized and eye catching when people get to your page. Um, we do recommend sort of sticking to things that are background um, related. Um, and I do see a chat coming in that I just wanted to answer real quick. Um, is there a specific dimension size? This is a common question. There is no specific dimension size because Mighty Cause as a platform is mobile responsive, which means that it changes based on the um, dimensions of the device that it's being used on. So for instance, if you have a phone, you're going to be holding it like this. If you have a desktop computer, you're holding it your screen looks like this. So Mighty Cause is built to adjust to those different sizes. So for that reason, um, there is a cropping tool that you can use. So if you have a, an image that you think you want to use, um, you can go ahead and plug it into that tool, try to crop it and see how it looks. Um, and one thing that I, I recommend doing is sort of just making your browser bigger and smaller and seeing how it looks. Um, and because it is responsive, I would stay away from anything with too much text, um, just because because some of those things might get caught off on different screens, um, depending on the device that's being used. So um, there, we don't have a specific dimension size, but obviously it is a long banner. Um, so anything that would make a good banner would work well in that space. Um, number three is telling your story. Um, in order for your story to be considered complete by the Mighty Cause platform, you'll want to have at least 50 words, which most of us can get to very easily when talking about our causes. Um, and make sure that you uh, put as much in there as you can in terms of hyperlinks, images, um, you can embed videos in there. So you can really make your story a space where you really are presenting your case for why your nonprofit is important to support and why your work in your community is so important to support. Um, and the more elements there are in your story, um, the better your page will be at keeping people there. So keep embedding a video is a great way to make your story more dynamic and to keep people on your page longer. Um, because what we know as you know, the people who run Mighty Cause is the longer they spend on your profile, the more likely they are to actually complete their donation. So um, add bullet points, add lists, add hyperlinks, add videos. Um, you can really do a lot there. There's an easy inline toolkit. So, um, you know, fully fill out your story and tell people who are visiting your page exactly who your nonprofit is and what you do in the world. Um, and then lastly, add some images. You do um, have the ability to connect your Facebook galleries, your Instagram account to your profile so that people can get the, uh, you know, the full scope of what you do. Um, and that way, if you're posting something on Instagram, it, we just automatically feed it over so you don't have to add that separately. Uh, there's also a media gallery that you can use. So if you wanted to share some specific pictures, you can also add those to sort of add to the story of what your nonprofit does. Um, and again, it's all about making that page more dynamic, making it catch people's eyes and capture their attention so that they complete their donation. Next sl uh, slide, please. So this is really important, uh, especially for organizations that were participating in 2020. This does not happen automatically. Uh, you will need to reset your metrics, uh, which is very easy to do, um, I promise. Uh, and we are working on a way to make this automated, but we're not quite there yet. So you'll have to go into your profile and make sure that you're in edit mode. Um, and then just find the amount that you raise. It's usually like $5,000 raised by 83 donors or whatever your amount last year was. Um, and then just click the edit button. That's a little circle icon with a pencil in it. Um, that's kind of the universal edit button on Mighty Cause. Um, and then you can adjust the statistics. So um, what you'll wanna do is uh, change the date from which you are calculating to May 1st, 2021 at midnight, um, because that's when the event starts starts and all of those donations will count towards your given May totals. Um, most often, if there is a discrepancy between what you're seeing on your profile and what you're seeing 
in a leaderboard, it's often this particular thing you started calculating, um, you know, in April. And so you're got, you've got some donations looped in there that don't actually count for the event. So you just want to make sure that you start calculating your metrics at 5-1-2021 at midnight Pacific time. Um, and then if you want to reset your goal, which I certainly recommend, uh, just click on the editing button near your goal. That's the progress bar that tells us how much you've raised and how close you are to your goal. And then just enter a new goal there. Um, so that's very simple and easy to do. Um, but you'll just definitely want to refresh this if you participated in 2020. Next slide. So I mentioned this earlier, um, your campaign screen. Um, so you do have a screen where you can view not only your campaigns, the ones that you've started at your nonprofit, but peer-to-peer -peer campaigns. It's just a toggle you go over to, um, you know, you press peer-to-peer -peer and you'll be able to see all of the campaigns that have been created for your organization. Um, and why this is important is because um, pretty much every campaign that has ever been created will show up in the search unless you hide it. So as an administrator, you have the ability to um, uh, hide those old campaigns so that nobody gets confused and the only campaigns that are showing in the search are your current ones. Um, and the peer-to-peer -peer view is also really helpful um, at keeping an eye on who's started a campaign, how much they've raised, whether or not they've published. Um, so that's a really helpful place to sort of get an overview of all of the campaign activity that's happening for your nonprofit. Um, and again, any campaigns that you haven't hidden, just take a minute to hide those if they're out of date so that you don't see them in the search, your donors don't see them in the search, and you only have current campaigns in the given May search. Next slide. So your checkout flow is something that you have a lot of control over with Mighty Cause, which I think is one of the coolest things about the platform. Um, so your checkout flow is basically just the process that donors go through when they click donate and until they complete the transaction. So um, you have a lot of um, options here. You can choose what donor you what donor data you collect from people who are making their donations. So if having a phone number is very important to your nonprofit because you have um, volunteers who are standing by to call people on the phone and thank them for making a donation to your campaign, um, you can collect that there. So just make sure that you are collecting the information that's most important. We will, by default, I believe, collect email address, um, obviously their name, the amount of their donation, and I believe their address. But if you need anything in addition to that, um, you can go ahead and add that into your checkout flow. Um, and one thing that's very important in your checkout flow is your custom donation suggest suggestions and descriptions. Um, and the, th the reason they're so important is because they hit donors at a really key moment when they're actually deciding how much money to give. Um, so you can use these to tie into your campaign and reinforce your impact. So um, what a lot of nonprofits will do, and it's very effective, is uh, find out what $30 buys for your nonprofit. Um, so if you are operating a food bank and $30 helps you feed a family of five for a week, um, that can be a really powerful um, amount to suggest to them along with that description. And it also reinforces that all of the money that you collect is going to be used to do good in your community. Um, so make sure that these are customized. Um, by default, it'll just be 25, 50, 75, and 100 with no description. Uh, but that is a lost opportunity to really reinforce your impact and boost people up to the next level of making a donation. They really do make a difference. Um, so show, uh, show those sections some love. Um, and you can also preview your checkout. So you don't have to make a, a test donation and spend your own money. You can actually preview the checkout process from beginning to end and see exactly what your donors see. Um, and we will be here to help your donors during given May. Um, we are available to your donors, your peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers, and to you. Um, but a lot of times donors will just contact you because they know you and they were trying to make a donation. So you can sort of see what things look like for them and maybe help them out. Um, and it'll also help you edit. So sometimes when we're just sort of checking things on a screen, uh, we don't realize that when we're doing those things, one on top of the other, it can kind of create a cumbersome process. So if you go through your checkout process and it's a little long, um, you might want to edit some things that are not essential out of that process. Um, and then you can also enable dedications and designations. So for instance, if you want to give people the opportunity to make a donation in memory of someone because you include those in your newsletter, 
you'll want to enable dedications um, and you'll be able to see that in your full donation report. Um, and if you have any particular funds that you would like to allow people to designate their donation for, you can enable that. And just to be perfectly clear, if you enable designations, you list uh, the different designations and your donors choose from that. So people cannot designate, they can't create their own designation. So um, if you enable that, you just want to put in the funds or the uh, particular purposes that you would like to allow people to designate their donation for, um, and they would choose from that list. So um, some really great options for, you know, checking out and getting information that you need and getting everything you need from the donors while they're making their donation. Um, so just shake, take a look at your checkout flow. Um, next slide, please. So your post checkout, um, most often when people have old information, it's hidden in this post checkout section of your checkout flow. Um, so definitely if you, this is your first year, you'll want to fill these out because these are really helpful tools. Um, but even if you participated in 2020 and you have these filled out, just look them over um, because this is, this is kind of where all the old information tends to live when somebody contacts us during event and goes, oh my gosh, my donors got this thing you message with all this old information, it's usually here. Um, so when you go to checkout flow, you can just toggle over to uh, post checkout and that's where you'll find these options. Um, and this is where your thank you page is. So after somebody completes a donation, um, you have a page that they can go to where they where you basically thank them. And uh, that way you've acknowledged them and they've gotten a thank you from your nonprofit. You can even add a CTA link. Um, so that is something that you'll definitely wanna fill out so that you can say thank you to everybody who completes a donation. Um, and then you can also add a custom message into your donation receipt. So when somebody makes a donation on Mighty Cause, um, we send them a receipt from the Mighty Cause Charitable Foundation, which is our donor advice fund. Um, and it has all of their tax information, but you can add a, a little message in there um, from your nonprofit that says thank you for donating to our campaign or whatever you would like. It's just a text box. You can, I think, provide some links, but because of email providers, you can't like embed a video, you would put that on your thank you page. But that way you sort of buy yourself a little bit of time so that you can enact your overall thank you plan and reach out to those donors and fully personally acknowledge them. So that's what that is for. And then you can also preview that experience. Um, I believe at least the page you can preview um, in, in order to see what that looks like for your donors. Next slide, please. So these are going to be really important to you. They're, this is sort of dry and technical, and I apologize, but your donation report and your disbursement report are extremely important. Um, one thing that I would suggest um, is setting up EFT. I've made that suggestion before, but I'm just going to reiterate um, because it'll help you get your donations more, more quickly. Um, if you've been um, you know, following the news, the mail is a little bit slow right now. Um, I definitely got some holiday cards into uh, the middle of January, and we don't want that to happen with your disbursement checks. We want you to have that money as soon as possible that's, so that you can put it to use at your nonprofit. Um, and EFT sends them twice per month and you'll get them directly in your bank account. So it basically um, eases some administrative burden and it makes sure that you get that, that money, those funds that you raised as quickly as possible. Um, and admins will receive uh, email notifications every time a donation is made. Um, you, If you want to on in the month of May, if you're getting a lot of donations, you can certainly send those to a special folder in your email inbox. Um, and I, what I would not recommend doing is trying to use your uh, email notifications to reconcile the disbursement or create a donation report because we do all of that for you. Um, but everybody will be notified uh, when you get a donation during given May. Um, and you can access donor data in real time through your donation report. Um, so your donation report is where you'll see the information about everybody who's completed a donation. You have some filters. So if you wanted to find people who've made recurring donations, um, you can do that as well. Um, but one thing I do want to mention is that on the donation report screen, it's actually a limited view. So you'll be able to see the donor, their email address, um, how much they donated. Um, but if you want the full story of their donation, including their address, um, the breakdown of whether they covered fees, any information that you were collecting, you can export your donation report as a CSV and the data there is much more rich. We just can't put all of that information onto one screen. Um, so if you're like, I don't know 
where this information is, it's in the CSV, just export it from your donation report. Um, and then you have a separate disbursement report um, that I would recommend using to reconcile your deposits um, because you'll be getting two per month. Uh, sometimes the cutoff dates can get a little bit funny and you might not know like what's included in that disbursement or it might seem like a big donation is missing. It's usually just down to the date that the disbursement was processed, um, but your disbursement reports, which are under the reports submenu, um, will help you understand exactly what was in that disbursement. You'll see every donor, um, how much they gave. You'll be able to see any fees that were taken out. So the credit card fees that we were talking about earlier, those will be accounted for on your donation report uh, or disbursement report rather, so that you can see exactly how much that was. And if there's any edge case, um, like somebody requested a refund, which we typically don't offer, but sometimes people like press a button twice and we give them a refund for that, you'll see that reflected on your donation or your disbursement report as well. Uh, next slide. Okay, I think this is our last slide. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention is that we are here to support you at Mighty Cause. This is part of our role as the technology uh, providers for Give in May is being available to help you. So we have a whole team of support professionals who are available to answer any questions you might have along the way, whether they're getting set up, it's issues getting set up, or you have a question about your donation report. We have a whole team of people who are available to answer that question for you and even walk you through um, any processes that you may be confused about. Um, if you need a quick uh, answer, we do have a support library that has walkthroughs with screenshots. So if it's a Saturday afternoon and you're trying to figure out how to do something on your page, check our support library first. That's support.mightycause.com. Um, but if you'd like to talk to somebody about your question, you can email us at support at mightycause.com. Email is the fastest way, but if you are a, for a phone person, uh, we do have people available to take your call Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. We are an Eastern time zone company. Um, so I know that for most of you, there's a little bit of a time difference, um, but you can call us at 202-800-1618. And please don't be shy. Any technical questions you have, if anything is confusing you, or if you need a little bit of extra help, we are here to support you. And that is part of what we're, we're here to do. So please reach out to us if you have anything you need help with. I believe that's it for my presentation. <laughs> Okay, great. I think there's just um, a couple of questions. And so we'll try to wrap this up by 1215 and be respectful of people's time. But as Pan shared, there'll be a recording, uh, a link to the recording that will go out to all of you as well as um, the slides. Um, so Linda, I think both of these questions are for you if you can see yes. them there in the Q&A. Plus there was one more um, in the chat about um, dimension of the banner image. Okay, um, sure. So uh, this is a question. I'll answer the question from Maria first. Um, is resetting the stats to calculate from 5121? Does this also adjust our fiscal year stats? Um, so it's really just a display on your profile. It's it's not really adjusting anything but what is displaying. So you still have all the reporting that you need on the back end. Um, and it just resets it so that when given May starts on May 1st, you're only counting donations on your profile um, that count toward the event. So so it's not actually changing anything but that display. Um, so I think that's what your question is. It's not actually really changing anything but just display numbers. So that when donors come to your page, they can see, oh, they don't they don't see that you've already hit your goal on May 1st because you still have last year's goal up. So it'll just reset it and refresh it so that donors can see that you're starting fresh for this year's campaign. Um, and there's an anonymous question. I said that very funnily, but <laughs> uh, can you say again how the peer to peer pages should be created and saved? Are they supposed to all appear on the search for a cause page or should they show up under the organization for who the solicitors are raising money for? Um, and how do you move those peer to peer pages from last year to the right place so the solicitors can edit what they had from last year? So there's about three questions in there. So I'm going to go through them one by one, I think. Um, um, so how the peer-to-peer -peer pages should be created and saved. There's actually a few different avenues through uh, the Mighty Cause platform that they can take. Um, the easiest route is to go to your Mighty Cause or your Given May profile, um, which is just your main organization profile, and click the button that says fundraise. Um, that kind of links up the fundraiser automatically. And the fundraiser will, it's, they, they, once they complete their page and they've 
completed all the required information, when they publish it, it will be live. Um, so that's sort of how it's saved. As soon as they publish the page, it becomes live um, and it can collect donations. They may want to turn those off, which they can do until May 1st, or at least not promote them until May 1st. Um, and they are going to appear in the search. So the search has a lot of filters. So on the given May site, um, when you go to search, you can filter by organizations, you can find specific campaigns, you can search by category. Um, so let's say, for instance, you have an art, you're an arts and culture organization, and, um, and you have some specific, very specialized categories for given May. But let's just say for, or we'll say you're an education organization, and somebody creates a campaign for your organization, um, it will show in the general search for education education fundraisers or education causes that people can support. So it'll show in the general search. Um, and what I would recommend is linking them, um, especially if it's something that you want to highlight, you have a section where you can do that on your, your profile, you can feature certain fundraisers um, and link them to link to them from your profile page. There's a few different places. Um, but yeah, they're kind of they're going to show up as fundraisers, you can see that they're different in the um, in the search, but they will show up there unless somebody filters out um, fundraisers and only searches for organizations. So I feel like that's a little bit more a little bit confusing. But if you go to the search, it should make more sense. But people can search for fundraisers in the general search. And they can also search for fundraisers and they can search for both and they can filter in all kinds of ways. Um, so it will show in the search if it's not hidden. Um, and make sure I'm not Okay, the one, any, any that were created last year. So what I would recommend for old fundraisers is actually just creating a new one, create a new fundraiser because it's more work to sort of refresh a fundraiser page than to create a new one. Um, so what I would recommend is just starting a new fundraiser from scratch. Um, if you're feeling generous, you can just sort of, we can also help you just plug over the information from last year to this year's um, fundraiser, but it is, it's really kind of convoluted to refresh like a, a separate fundraiser that was, you know, created by somebody for a, the current year when it was last year's fundraiser. So my advice would be to just create a new page for that person and make use of the template function so that you can pre-fill some of those parts. And if it's somebody who really, you know, was attached to their content, it, it can be copied and pasted over. Um, but it's just, it's a little bit more convoluted to sort of rejigger an old one than just create a new one. So I hope that helps. And I think that's it. So let me find the chat question. Okay, great. Yeah, I think that's it. I've been monitoring the chat as well. So I think that wraps it up. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, and I just did want to remind everyone to please register. We hope you all will be participating in this year's campaign. You can register through April 23rd. That's the deadline. But I think the sooner you're able to kind of get started, the better. So you can get your page customized and be ready to go on May 1. Um, and you can just register at givenmay.org. So again, thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you so much, Linda, for all the great content and information and um, hope you, everyone has a great rest of the week.